So today I've got another success story for you, but this isn't just any success story. In fact, I hope by now, if you've been watching this channel for a while, you're getting bored of my success stories. That's actually what I would love to hear. I would love to get that feedback because we're telling so many success stories that you realize that osteoporosis is preventable and reversible in most people. But today's success story is unique, and I've been waiting to bring a story like this to our YouTube channel until we had the right data so that I could actually show you the way that we do this. What I'm talking about here is a patient who is in her 70s who came to us because she'd been on bone health drugs for so long. She wanted to get off of it. She didn't know how to do it. And I told her that there was probably a way. So we went through the process. And we now have enough data to say that not only is she not losing bone coming off of these drugs, she's actually getting better. So stick around if you or a loved one has been on a bisphosphonate or prolia for a long time, wants to come off the drugs, but doesn't know how, this is how we do it. So like I said, this patient, Marilyn, is in her, let's call it mid 70s. She came in again because she had been on bone health drugs since the mid 1990s literally since 1995. Now that's the year that Fosamax was actually FDA approved for osteoporosis. So she's been on these drugs as long as they've been on the market. Wow. That's nearly three decades of using an anti-resorptive drug because she's been on different bisphosphonates. She's been on prolia. She's never been on an anabolic drug. So she has suppressed her bone metabolism for 30 years. Remarkable. Now, recently, two of her friends who were also on similar drug patterns had atypical femur fractures. So they suffered a fracture of their femur because their bones had become dense and brittle. And she decided, that's it. I'm going to come off this drug. I'm going to find a way. And she found us. And that was back in 2023. And so she asked the question, what do I do? How do I come off this drug? And she had the fear and anxiety that everybody on these drugs has, which is, what happens when I come off this drug? My doctor tells me I can't stop it. If I come off this drug, will I have a fracture? Am I going to lose all the bone that I've either gained or maintained over the course of the time on the drug? Now, before I go on, if you have seen a success story for yourself, I would love to hear about it. Because again, I want to flood the YouTube channels, the Instagram channels, the Facebook channels with as many stories of success of reversing osteoporosis as we can. So if you've had a success story, please drop it in the comments here on YouTube. And while you're there, if you wouldn't mind hitting that subscribe button, that helps us reach more people so more people will see your comment. Now, what's interesting about Marilyn is that when Marilyn came in, she was really doing a lot of the right things. And what I mean by that is that she was a lifestyle all-star. No processed foods, no seed oils, organic, grass-fed. She had a fasting window. She had a supplement stack that was really impressive. She, clearly, she was already doing her research. She was using some very high-tech supplements. I don't know what her supplement budget was on a monthly basis, but it was high because she was on a ton of stuff. But yet, she's still losing bone, even on Prolia. Now, let's talk about that just for a quick second. How does someone lose bone when they're on a bone drug like Prolia? Well, remember I said that she's been on these drugs for 30 years. And if you've heard me talk about osteoporosis, you hear me say that osteoporosis is an imbalance of bone metabolism. So if you're losing bone more than you're gaining bone, you will eventually develop osteoporosis depending on your starting point and the duration. It's just as simple as that. So then when we talk about reversing osteoporosis, we're simply talking about reversing that, that um, equation, right? So we need to build more bone than we're breaking down. The bone drugs, specifically the bisphosphonates, the prolia, the bone drugs that are anti-resorptive squash bone metabolism completely. So we'll talk about bone turnover markers in a minute, but if we squash bone metabolism completely, you will reliably increase bone mineral density. Most people will on these drugs. You will reduce fracture risk in the short term. It's predictable because you can see it in the studies. These large studies show it. But the studies don't go beyond one, three, five years. Perlia has data out to 10 years and beyond but you don't see data at 30 years. So what happens if you suppress bone metabolism for too long? Well, the bones continue to develop calcification. They actually go through the process of, of calcifying the, the cartilage matrix that got laid down before, but it starts to taper off because you're no longer laying down the cartilage matrix and you aren't able to break down bone 
because you're destroying the osteoclast function, literally poisoning these cells. So you're poisoning these cells that need to break down the bone in order to grow new bone. You don't have breakdown, therefore you cannot make new bone. You cannot keep your bones strong, so they end up becoming brittle. So then what happens after 30 years? Well, she hasn't had good bone metabolism in 30 years. Now, fortunately, she also hasn't had any fractures, so she's in a reasonably good starting point. But her T-score continued to drop, and that's what really provoked the fear. She wanted to get off the drug because she saw her friends have fractures, and she was getting worse. So when she came in, one of the things that we recommended is let's get a REMS scan. So if you're not familiar with REMS, REMS is the ultrasound device we talk about on a regular basis from the company Ecolite. And her REMS was actually pretty in line with her DEXA. Her DEXA was a little bit worse. Her REMS showed that she had a lumbar spine T-score of negative 2.5, femoral neck negative 2.6, negative 2.7. Now, those T-scores aren't that bad, but her fragility score, which is the predictor of fracture, was over 50, which is pretty darn high. So while her T-scores looked a little better on REMS than they did on DEXA, her fragility scores did not look good. So we knew we weren't in a good starting point. Now, what's interesting here, and I would love to see more research on this, is I would expect somebody who doesn't have good bone turnover to have a poor fragility score over time. That study hasn't been done, but I would expect somebody who has 30 years of anti-resorptive drugs to not have a good fragility score because they can't build new bone. So she got the rims done and that was actually helpful because she saw, you know, hey, this is looking better. I have work to do, but I'm not maybe in as bad of a spot as I thought I was. And of course, you can't compare apples to oranges. You have to consider DEXA and REMS each for what they are, but it's not a bad starting point for her with her first REMS. Now, we also did additional testing for her because at in her mid-70s, the question really is, are you a candidate for hormone replacement therapy? Are you open to it? And truthfully, the answer was she wasn't. She had a strong family history of heart disease. She was concerned that she was potentially going to be at risk of an event. We did actually go down the testing pathway to see if she would potentially be a candidate for estrogen at 20 plus years out. And the CCTA with clearly did show a little bit of disease, but really not much. In fact, less than I have as a 40, what am I, seven, 47 year old man. So she actually had really good looking arteries, but even with that, she wasn't willing to take the risk. And of course, there was not a good enough study for me to tell her at this level of disease, what is your actual risk of starting estrogen? I think it's really low, but I can't really give her a number. And I, I can certainly say it's not zero. So she was also willing to take an estrogen-like product. So we used a product that has genistein in it and maca. So we're still pushing on estrogen receptors. We're just not using estradiol specifically. And the estrogen receptor stimulation through genistein and maca is mild compared to estrogen. And we don't think that there's likely that same risk of having a cardiovascular event on these over-the-counter supplements. Now, we also switched her from levothyroxine to NP thyroid. That's something we do frequently when we see just sluggish looking and symptoms of low thyroid function, even treated with levothyroxine. Her TSH was not at goal either way. Uh, so looking at free T3, TSH, other labs and symptoms, we decided to switch her over and she felt really good on that. Now, we also updated her supplement stack. And again, she was taking a ton of supplements. So this was kind of an easy uh, mix and match. I'm not going to go through this whole thing because it wouldn't matter anyway, because all supplement stacks should be customized to the individual person. So me listing all of hers is not going to help you decide what to take for you. All right. So now what's cool about this case is that, you know, when, when she came in, we had an initial bone turnover marker set. And I'll, I'll describe those in a minute. But we have this discussion with all of our patients who want to come off of a bone drug to say, look, usually someone who goes on Prolia stays on Prolia. If someone's on an anabolic drug, they switch to an anti-resorptive drug, either a bisphosphonate or Prolia. Pretty rarely do conventional doctors recommend coming off of these drugs or doing an anabolic and then not an anti-resorptive. In our practice, we do it differently. Because I feel that if you look at all of the potential tools for bone health, you should be able to come off of these drugs and maintain the bone that has been improved on the drugs, assuming that that's happened. But there's not enough evidence to say what needs to be done in, in what population. So this has to be done very, very carefully. So in our patients who are desiring to come off of these drugs, we will make sure that everything's optimized and then they'll come off the drug and then we watch them very closely. We do that by getting more frequent imaging, more frequent bone turnover markers. We keep very close track of them. And this is a great example. So over the next year, we kept a very close track of her. We repeated our bone uh, turnover markers consistently. And what we saw is that in a year on REMS, not only did she not lose bone, but it actually got better. Now, not massively better. I wouldn't expect it to, 
but her T score improved from negative two, I forget what it was, was it negative two six to negative two three? Her fragility score got better. Her femoral neck got better more than her spine. So I'm not even worried about what percentage change that is. That's irrelevant to me. The fact that she technically no longer has osteoporosis is also irrelevant to me. What I'm really excited about for her is that we did not see the rebound that she was anticipating, that she was expecting as a result of coming off of the drug prolia. She also didn't have any fractures. The fear that she had, the anxiety that she had has dissipated. She's a different woman. She's doing things that she was afraid to do before. She has an outlook on life that she didn't have before. I'm so excited to bring this case to you because what it shows, and this is just an N of one, this is one person, but what it shows is that this is possible, but it has to be done very, very carefully. Now, I wanna go over these bone turnover markers because this, I think, is a really important point. And if you're working with a provider to help do this, please have them get these bone turnover markers. A quick note about the bone turnover markers. They have to be done under the same criteria every time. You have to eliminate as many variables as possible. What I mean by that is that these things are impacted by time of day, um, hormone fluctuations, dietary fluctuations, exercise, et cetera. So they move up and down based off of all of these different variables. So do the labs at the same time every day. We're always recommending fasted labs anyway. So it should be, you know, early in the morning anyway. Try to recreate as many of the variables as possible. So eat, you know, meal the same time the night before. Either do or don't exercise the same as you did the day before and certainly don't exercise the morning up. Um, keep as many of these variables as consistent as you can. For women that are still cycling, this has to be done on the same day of the month. So you have to do this in rhythm with your cycle if you're still cycling. Most of our patients are post-menopause, that's not an issue. But what I wanna show you here is that when she came in, she was still within that six month window after her last injection. So her last injection was August of 2023. She came in in January, or at least her first labs were done in January 24. Her CTX was in the mid 30s. Her P1 and P was under 10. So if you've heard me talk about these things before, you know that that is extremely suppressed bone turnover. CTX of double digits is very low. CTX under 40 is extremely low. This is what Perlia does. And then the P1 and P is going to go down. P1 and P, for those who don't remember, is the bone building biomarker. CTX is the bone breakdown biomarker. So P1 and P is under 10. I want it to be over 100 naturally. If you're on Forte or an anabolic drug, it'll go 200, 300. Here it's under 10. So you have, again, extremely suppressed bone turnover markers that we need to follow because these are going to change as she comes off the drug, right? So then let's fast forward. So now let's go a year from her previous uh, injection uh, in August of 23. Now we're talking August of 24. Now her CTX is a little over 600. Okay, that's higher than I'd like to see it. Her P1 and P though is almost 120. Okay, that puts her ratio at 187. Let me define the ratio for you. So the ratio is P1 and P over CTX. P1 and P in the units that they're delivered in, in the US, CTX divided by 1,000. So you have to move the decimal point over three, uh, three decimal point places. So uh, that ends up looking like, in this case, it'd be 119 over 0 0.639, which gives you 187. Now, we use a, a kind of an arbitrary number of 150 as our goal with the ratio. We're still working on figuring out if that's the right cutoff, but that's what we use. She's meeting that here, even though her CTX is higher than I'd like to see it, she's turning over bone, right? But her ratio is still good. She's building bone too. This is actually a good thing. We just need to watch this carefully and make sure her CTX doesn't go through the roof. Now, if she were on HRT, her CTX would not be this high, but she wasn't willing to go through that process. So we're still working with what we have. Now let's fast forward another almost nine months actually to March of this year. So now her CTX comes down a little bit. So now it's in the low 500s. Her P1 and P is nearly the same. So what does that mean about a ratio? A ratio gets better. It's 211. So her ratio looks great. Her REMS is looking improved. Am I worried about her coming off of Perlia at this point? No. Now she needs to keep doing what she's doing, but she came in as a rock star. She's going to come out as a rock star. She is on the right path. She is seeing improvement in her bone health. We are looking now at bone health as a biomarker of health span for her. We can erase the fear and anxiety of osteoporosis and fracture.
So remember for Marilyn, this was about continuing on the lifestyle piece, updating her supplements, optimizing hormones to the best of our ability, and then watching closely. So again, I'm gonna say it very clearly. Do not stop medications without your doctor's approval. Please work with someone who understands hormone optimization, who understands bone health optimization, and watch what happens carefully as you come off of these drugs. We're building programs out to help people do this, but please do not do it alone. I see people try to do this all the time, and I can tell you that most of them fail because they don't have the right information, they're not watching it close enough, and I've seen bad things happen to people as they try to do this. So I'm not sharing this video to tell you to do this on your own, this is not medical advice. What I'm sharing is our experience in patients who are going through this, who are not even under the best circumstances of being able to optimize HRT. This is a woman in her mid 70s, not on estrogen, coming off of prolia and doing it successfully. So I wanna deliver the hope of that message but please, if you're considering doing this, do it carefully, do it under the correct supervision. And if you're not sure where to go with your own bone health journey, please consider joining our masterclass as a starting point. We run this about every other week. I run it myself. We talk about the top five mistakes people are making as they go through their bone health journey. I wanna time collapse your journey for you so that you can see improvement faster. Let's teach you about these five mistakes. We also leave about 20 minutes for Q&A. So if you're interested in that, look for the link in the description on YouTube. Again, totally free. If you're listening to this on a podcast, go to our website, osteocollective.com, and you can sign up for the masterclass there as well. That's it for today. Remember that a diagnosis of osteoporosis isn't the end, but deciding to reverse it is a beginning. I'll see you in the next video.